Well, again, we continue our Q's Connection series. Brian Higgins with you in Syracuse. And uh, it's great now to begin reaching out to some alums here and on this Memorial Day weekend. Who could be better to touch base with uh, than Rourke Denver, the, the former great Syracuse lacrosse player and two-time national champ who then went into the military and had uh, an unbelievable career as part of uh, the Navy SEALs. So, uh, Rourke, uh, welcome in here on this Memorial Day weekend. And uh, so glad you've uh, carved out a few minutes for us. No, I appreciate it, Brian. Thanks for having me. It's fun. Well, uh, Rourke, uh, just that your, your thumbnail autobiography is this. You were, you were a Syracuse lacrosse player, you were a Navy SEAL, then you trained Navy SEALs, and then you wrote a book about all of that, which became a, a, a bestseller. So uh, that's probably cutting you a little short shrift there, but at least that's a little thumbnail, right, of what you've been up to here the last 20, 25 years. No, it's been great. I mean, I, I, I uh, you know, I certainly trace history and foundations of uh, any success I've met with even beyond my time at Syracuse, but it was not a small um, chapter in that story. So playing, you know, playing uh, lacrosse at Syracuse in the mid nineties, you know, with coach Simmons. And then of course, uh, you know, Desco as the, as the right-hand man and, and Donahue and all the uh, great players that uh, were there in that era is just a unbelievable kind of formational foundational time in my life. So uh, I, I look at it uh, nothing but fondly and, and paid huge dividends uh, in my military career and beyond for sure. You mentioned Coach Desco. We found out earlier this week he's going into the Lacrosse Hall of Fame, and I'd imagine he was the lead assistant when you were there. The, a very well deserved honor to, to find that out here this week. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I got a real lucky time to obviously play at the program, but also um, with him. I, I don't think the young Lions right now there know any. <laughs> I don't even know if they know the man compared to the way uh, we did there. You know, everybody's got generational uh, periods of time on on their behavior and kind of their experience, and I, I had the unique and those of us that played in that window, the really unique time to have um, Coach Simmons, you know, absolutely on Mount Rushmore. If you start talking about, um, you know, coaches for lacrosse, um, and, and probably Coach Desco would be in the conversation for that um, that monument as well. But, you know, in that era, Simmons was was very much towards the end of his career. Uh, his sole purpose was to – I don't know if it ever wasn't, but was to recruit a, a very specific type of athlete and personality trait mm -hmm. and, and then just light fires underneath them and make them believe they could do anything. Uh, and, and Coach Desco in that window was just the disciplinarian, the, 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 the tactician, and, and was um, – was just an intense, intense man, and, and I enjoyed uh, playing for both of them. I, I don't think the young guys now, and I've, I've seen him since and had a great time reconnecting any time I'm in town, and uh, he's a much calmer version of, of the man I knew for sure, but uh, obviously still quite potent on the field. Well, I'll, I'll say this to you, Rourke. He's no longer spewing an acid tablets on the sidelines. So he's, yeah, he's, they, they, had, uh, they, they could have had stock in, uh, in <laughs> Tom with, with how much was going on, uh, going down the pipe when we were playing, that's for sure. I'm so interested because, you know, I think a lot of people watching here, everyone knows the history of Syracuse lacrosse and the great success and certainly of a Roy Simmons Jr. role of that. And I think most Syracuse lacrosse fans, you know, are aware of his personality and kind of how, how he just feels more like a laid back guy and he, he's doing it his way. Yeah. And then you go into the military, which, you know, you, you hear coaches and you think of drill sergeants and things like that. Roy Simmons Jr. had to be as opposite of that as anyone that has ever coached anything on planet Earth. But at least my guess is that probably affected you in some way, just, just the lessons he, he, he gave you, even though it must have been a completely different way uh, that, that you get hit with when you, when you join the Seals. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you know, th there's some things that I think, you know, no one sees other than those that are kind of within um, within the culture and the brotherhood as much as, you know, he's very much, I think, an open book or always has been and um, can make anyone feel uh, as though, you know, he's speaking direct to them, you know, cares about them, passionate about them, and, that, and that's sincere. Um, you know, I think one of the underlying threads that a lot of people forget is, you know, his nickname was Slugger, and it wasn't because he played, you know, lightly in his era of time. I remember uh, Jim Brown was at a practice one time, and he, he, he kind of vocalized that, uh, you know, he would have probably fought anybody at campus other than number 16, which, which is the <laughs> number I got to wear when I played there. So uh, th that was that, – that was he was a tough – 
um, imposing figure, even though he had more of an artistic, cerebral um, storytelling style. I mean, if you shook the man's hand, and if, if I'm sure you have even recently, you, you know, he's got big bear paws and a, and a vice grip, um, even though he speaks with a, with a soft voice for the most part. But he had a lot of intensity to him as well. Um, but, but you're dead on. I mean, the formational stories – uh, we don't have enough time to get to get into right now that I could I could reflect on and anybody that ever played for him, whether you were a four year multi time All American, you know one of his true darlings, or probably even somebody that never really saw the field but spent time um, grinding out in practice. You you could certainly cite um, Coach Simmons stories and things that impacted you. I think his storytelling ability is something that I've I've really taken with me. I mean both. Uh, in my time in the military, they'd be able to, you know, communicate what we wanted to do on the battlefield, motivate, not like you got to spend a lot of time motivating SEALs. They, they want to get in a fight, but, but framing things in ways and talking about, um, um, you know, the history of things we're doing. Like when we went after Afghanistan, it was not lost on me because I love to read as well, but that was a big part of his life and, and understanding history that, you know, Alexander and the Macedonians and, and, and Churchill and all these people that, that um, you know, I'd studied had walked probably on the same dirt that uh, I was now walking and <laughs> probably a better lesson to senior leadership that there's, there's no reason to spend any extended time in Afghanistan because empires seem to go there to die. But that was very much, you know, one of Simmons' ways of connecting um, those traditional stories to what we we're going to do on the field. So it was a tremendous one-for-one, one, um, you know, kind of gift from him to kind of me to see that and replicate that and use that uh, in my military life. It was a real gift, real gift. I say, Rourke, I'm reading a book about uh, Churchill now. I think he and Roy would get along in, in some in some way that that can't properly be explained historically, but uh, yeah. it would crash the internet if we tried to figure that out here over the next right. uh, few right. minutes. But or it's been so interesting, and I think Memorial Day weekend is such a perfect time to talk to you. I read your book, I don't know, a year or two ago, and, you know, you a big-time athlete. I can't say it ever crossed my mind for even a second to try to become a SEAL. I would have uh, washed out on the drive up to the gate, I, I think, before they, any of that happened. But you really took us behind the scenes there in your book of of how that happens. What kind of reaction have you gotten to writing that book from the SEALs? As a, as a group, are they, I don't know, happy to see that part of it exposed and how tough it really is? Or is there uh, some pushback of, hey, that, that's our behind the scenes stuff and, you know, that's, that's our thing? Yeah, there, there's definitely a little of both. I mean, there, there's been, um, when I wrote my book, there are probably only two or three other books that kind of delved into that. Um, I tried to be very purposeful about the way I approached the material and that I didn't want to give a playback to our enemies. I didn't want to give things away that um, candidates that would go into the program would necessarily massively benefit from to you know, maybe enhance their ability to get through training because it's really everybody's individual kind of crucible to get through. Um, and I think it's mixed. I mean, I, I think there's some people certainly in the SEAL space that are talking currently in the public space that the guys, uh, you know, still in the community kind of lament and are unhappy that are out there. Um, most of the feedback I've gotten from from teammates and folks that know me are like, well, if somebody's going to be talking, I'm glad it's you. You know, you do so with, uh, you know, with gravitas and hopefully respect and, and humility to talk about what we are and the things we've learned. And I, and I try and hold myself to even a much higher standard than um, even when I wrote that book and sent it to the Pentagon and had it scrub to make sure there is nothing inappropriate to go out. Um, so I try and be very, very careful and hold myself to that standard. Um, there's plenty of people within the community that hate that there has ever been a single word written about what we do. And I think they have a complete um, voice in that argument. And I also think there's an argument where uh, I joined the SEALs because as you mentioned, uh, I was reading Churchill my senior year of college at Syracuse. That was the spark um, that lit me into military service and, and reading um, has always kind of guided my life. And so the idea of being able to pay it forward and write something that might uh, motivate a young lion to serve. And I, and I can't tell you, I've lost count of the number of, of, yeah. of young men that have written me and been like, hey, man, I read your book. I'm going to serve. I uh, can't wait to do it. And that's, um, that's a pretty good feeling. So um, it's it split. It's split. What reaction have you gotten, I guess, from the non-SEAL community? I mean, that's something like, for me personally, you, you know, okay, yeah, the Navy SEALs are the best. And you know that, and that's what you know about it. You don't really know anything else. And then every now and again, every, you know, half decade or so, there's a momentous historical thing that happens. Who was there? Yeah, the SEALs were there. And you're like, okay. Yeah. And that's all you know about it. What kind of reaction did you get from, you know, just 
people that picked it up and read it and said, wow, that's some crazy stuff you guys read. Yeah, yeah. I think I scared my mom pretty good. She probably was happy <laughs> to have read that, you know, when I was past my uh, tactical assault team leader time and running training. Um, I don't think it surprised my dad and brother. I think they thought it, it was a perfect fit uh, in, in finding that um, you know, that peer group and kind of that, that, that warrior culture to be a part of, uh, you know, when it comes to civilian, it's always interesting. I, I think people, as you said, have a tremendous amount of respect, um, for everybody that serves. I think they put an added level to special operations and kind of the elite operators. Um, uh, sincerely, I don't think we see it as that way. I mean, I think whether you're a mechanic, a cook, whatever job you're doing in the military, it is all one team that kind of prepares everybody to go do, um, the mission sets we're tasked to go do. So I, I, I don't really put any rank, uh, um, priority on those those different units. I was happy to be part of the one. Um, I felt like going from Syracuse to that was a very natural progression. I mean, in the era that I played at Syracuse, um, we were one of the true titans on the battlefield. The current young Lions have brought that back, which is exciting. It's a shame it got cut so short. But, you know, in that era, that, that, was, that was the elite. I mean, the best, every person on our team was the best person from their, you know, area, state, uh, region. And um, then you kind of came together, performed at the highest level with a bunch of very specific skill sets, face-off man, goalie, defenseman, long pole, attackman, and the SEAL teams are the same. It's super, super elite um, folks that kind of get to the, 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 the top of the mountain where only lightning exists, and, and then you see if you can, you can hang up there. Um, so it, it felt like a natural progression, not one that was a big jump or departure. Um, and, and so the feedback's been great. The feedback's been great. In, in general, people just say, I can't imagine you ever doing that. I couldn't do it. And, and in the end, it's uh, what lives in here and in here. It's got nothing to do um, really with your body it's got to do with your spirit and pushing forward and, and that, that's that's another parallel I think the reason we won the championships and were as competitive as we were in the era I was there was also in large part to coach Simmons and the way he had us believe what we could do it, it really was I mean in any given calendar year in that era the the, the depth of talent uh, across division one now is is indistinguishable from when I played any given Sunday, you know, somebody could beat you, but come, you know, Memorial Day weekend, it was about four and five teams that showed up there every year I played. But out of those Titans, any one of those teams could have won the championship. It really had to be something extra. And I think when I look at the years that we won the championship, there's just something special about those teams. They had a little extra spirit, a little extra something in the tanks that the other teams didn't. And, um, and that's what got us over the line. Yeah, um, obviously, uh, while well, uh, you were in school, it was uh, during the rise of Princeton, and uh, you got a title uh, your senior year, so it was kind of the, the building of uh, lacrosse we know, and it, it's exploded. You're, you're sitting in the city named for you, apparently. You're, you're in Denver right now, and yeah. my goodness, for a lacrosse guy like you, it must be interesting to be out there and uh, what has become, I guess, more the, the Western hub uh, of the sport in the United States than anywhere else right now. Well, it's satisfying for me because, you know, as you know, I grew up in the Bay Area. So I, I came from California when California lacrosse was not on the map. I mean, there was nobody um, really playing at the elite level then. I played for a club team, four separate high school, fed kids into that program. I only picked up a stick for the first time my sophomore year of high school. Um, I was into aquatics and water polo and was gonna stay out there and you know keep uh, keep tan skin, play on the coast of California and out there. And then, then I, frankly, I, I fell in love with the game. And then when I met Coach Simmons, uh, even when I was out there at camp, that's how he got, I got a, you know exposure. Um, you know, even when I told him, he said, you're from where? <laughs> I said, the Bay Area of California. And now there's not a big team in the country that's not carrying, you know, multiple kids from Colorado and Texas and California and Oregon. I mean, just the growth is spectacular. Um, and having played against Coach Tierney, you know, when he brought Princeton to where they were and we were, you know, duking back and forth every year I, I played, um, it doesn't surprise me that he's grown the game in, in a Western state. And I think that will continue. I mean, I, I think it'll be super fun when a, when a, a true West, you know, West Coast team, a California team um, is able to get away from the club ranks and, and compete on the national stage. And, um, you know, they could, they, they, could, they could pull players from nothing but, but the West and, and be competitive. It's, it's an amazing growth and amazing transition. What are you uh, doing in Denver right now? So, uh, I, you know, when I left active duty, I stayed in the reserves because I, I did 13 active duty years. You've got to get to 20 to get your retirement and medical and all that good stuff. So that was worth seeing through. Um, so I did, you know, seven years of reserve time and about nine months ago uh, retired and finally was able to separate from the military and, and get that in my rearview mirror, uh, you know, happily, but you know, also uh, with a tremendous amount of uh, a respect and, and joy thinking back on that time. I do a lot of consulting now with companies on, on high performance teams, leadership 
leadership um, culture, uh, a lot of speaking events where, where, where folks can book me uh, to come in and fire up their team. I work with a lot of uh, work with plenty of pro teams, Olympic teams, um, and, you know, a few writing projects, few silly entertainment things that have popped up. I'm always, uh, I keep my ears open on that, but it's not such a deep desire that I've pursued acting or any of that stuff. If there's a show that I feel like I can inspire through, I'll entertain that thought. Um, if not, it's, it, it's not for me, but now I'm making it up as I go along. I've got some new projects coming, which are fun. Um, I'd really like to dig into kind of making the culture and families and, and particularly young people stronger and more resilient and tougher. So um, working on some of those things as well, but uh, having a lot of fun. All right, Rourke, and, and these things, I always enjoy looking at people, what people, how they got the room set up on the Zoom or what, what you got <laughs> yeah. behind you. If, I'm, if yeah. I'm looking right here, you got the, the famous Teddy Roosevelt quote over one shoulder, if I'm reading your poster right there. All right. I'm seeing the, the Syracuse lacrosse helmet. If uh, it looks like maybe some shell casings there, you got some American <laughs> flags. I mean, it, it feels like you got your your whole life foot boiled down on the walls behind you. Yeah, man. I mean, I think mementos and uh, uh, you know the trophies you take over years just kind of connect you to the different windows of time. So yeah, having the helmet, which uh, is cooler than the helmets that that uh, we actually played in, that's one. I, I that's actually one that um, uh, uh, Grande himself, Kyle, mm -hmm. uh, gave me when you know when you leave the program if you leave in good standing in that era you could always go back and find Kyle and if uh if you looked like a dinosaur going into a lacrosse tournament uh even though I'm sure he wasn't supposed to somehow a new helmet or a pair of gloves would would find its way to you so I think this is the last one that uh that he gave me so I didn't look like a dinosaur the last time I played um but yeah I keep those mementos up and then the Teddy Roosevelt quote's fun because that's actually one that Simmons um read to us right before I think the 93 championship when my, I was a freshman and we won the championship again in North Carolina and one of the best championship games ever I mean down to the wire uh I remember coach either before a game or right before the championship weekend he told us about the you know the man in the arena and and uh, I've kept it ever since it is one of the the classic quotes uh, of all time up there and sure. yeah I was gonna say that is definitely a newer version of a helmet than the, the buckets you guys would have been uh, yeah. playing with back back in the 90s and yep. I'd say this it's hard to keep a, a, a Simmons story under about a half hour you managed to keep a, a Kyle story under a half hour, which is all, it's also hard to do. It is, it is. He's, uh, he's one that stacked up as many stories as anybody in the program and, and rightfully so. And, and through the, through the, you know, just, I don't know, the grace and excellence of who he is, you know, everybody loves giving everybody in the program a hard time, but he, he was one of the greats. And um, it's funny when you go through that program, um, everybody has on some level a different experience. I mean, if you're, you know, Roy Colsey was one of my great teammates. Rick Beersley was one of my great teammates. And those guys showed up, um, you know, they showed up as royalty, earned every minute of it. But, you know, they're four-time All-Americans, you know, multiple-time, um, you know, both national champions and just, you know, absolute um, titans of the game, Hall of Famers, and, and – um, or if not, soon will be. I know, I, know, I know Rise. But, I mean, you know, those guys have a very different experience than, than other people that kind of scrap it out and grind to kind of get to those starting roles. Um, but once you make it to kind of the top of that spot, you're a starter, uh, then your connection to guys like Kyle and, and um, you know, for me, Tim Neal, one of the athletic trainers, head athletic trainers that used to tape my ankles before every game, all those people become much more family and much more connected to you that you'll stay with stay in touch with them forever so yeah it's a special special program and I'm sure they have those people as well but uh yeah it, it feels very much like family I'd say Rourke I mean we love Rick around here I don't know if you've heard he's a four-time All-American I don't know if he's ever uh no, he's ever I, brought I, that I've up heard he's pretty good I've heard he's pretty good <laughs> all right uh, and Kyle uh, Kyle I, I don't know how we're going to do on the broadcast next year he, he missed out unlike a three quarters of a season of talking. So we're really going to have to, to cram Boy. it into the games next year. So uh, wish me luck on that one. Uh, I want to ask you about this. One of the reasons, I mean, we talk about your military career, but lacrosse and Memorial Day, this has gone hand in glove for a long, long time. The title game yeah. on Memorial Day is what we know. It's what you've played in. And uh, I, I think even more so in recent years, uh, the military aspect of that has been woven in. What is your view, I guess, of the relationship between – lacrosse and Memorial Day. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It kind of follows that that timeline continuum continuum throughout life that, that I, I've talked a little bit about. I mean, when I played, um, you know, if I'm being honest, I didn't think much about Memorial Day other than Memorial Day was championship weekend. And, and you know, we were there all four weekends. I was there. I mean, in that era, parents would, would book their hotel room when they checked out for the following the following uh, championship weekend um, was how predictive that was. But um, I didn't I didn't think much of the weight and kind of 
intensity of, of the fact that we were competing and, and getting into fights uh, when people were being honored for getting in real fights ac across the world. And then, of course, when I served, Memorial Day has taken on a very, very different feel. So uh, a, a lot of civilians team seem to um, confuse Memorial Day and Veterans Day. You know, Veterans Day, I'll get a bunch of people that'll call me and say, hey, um, you know, thank your teammates for their sacrifice. And that's not what that day for. That day is to honor those that served. And it's kind of a different feel. Memorial Day really is the day we remember those that, that uh, uh, paid the ultimate price and, and gave, uh, you know, the last full measure, as they say. And I, I've lost count of the teammates that, um, that did that in my time in the teams. And so uh, it's a strange day now for me. You know, if Syracuse or, or the, the big dance game is going on on that Monday, uh, I'm delighted to, to watch and, and have even been back to a few. But it's also a, a somber day and one of those days that we kind of take time to um, reflect and, and, and go a little bit more circumspect or pass um, stories about teammates we lost uh, in the fight and share those stories. So it's a it's a definitely more intense day uh, than frankly it was when I was suiting up and, and going to bang heads against uh, you know our, our, our competitors. I guess Rook, the, the first year really struck me in the in the way that it that it wasn't just okay this is just the day the game happened to be it was it was the 04 title game and you know we're going through the season and ramping up for it. It's Mike Powell's senior year. There's a lot of storylines. Arch beat Hopkins in a wild game in the semifinals. Then all of a sudden you're playing Navy on Memorial Day. And it's like, whoa. And they're going, they do all their graduation stuff over the weekend at the Marine Corps Memorial Stadium. And I just remember during that game, the, the three Looney brothers were such an important part of that story. Brendan Looney goes into the SEALs and he's killed in action in Afghanistan now. I think it's right on a decade ago. It's one of those things to me, and I don't know if you knew Brendan personally, but you know the SEALs in general, that, that that's really, I think, made it, stand out a little more here in the lac lacrosse community of late known stories like that. No, for sure. I'll never forget that game. I was actually had just transferred from the East Coast SEAL teams to the West Coast SEAL teams. I was playing on an actual all-Navy club team. You know, we had a, a Navy team and they said, well, we'll grandfather you in. You didn't go to Naval <laughs> Academy, but since you're, you're an actual Navy man, we'll, we'll let you play. And great guys. I remember they invited me to a bar there in San Diego to go watch that game. And, you know, you probably remember that game like the back of your hand, but it was looking bad for us for a while. And every, all of them are just razzing me and, and giving full, 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 uh, full aggressive excitement about them winning. And I was like, eh, you gotta, you gotta wait till the last tick of the clock. This team has enough firepower to bring it back. And then it was like cricket inside that bar when, uh, when when they got it done. But it was interesting watching the game because it made me think, well, if any team on this day was going to beat Syracuse that, that I could stomach, this, I guess, would be the one, even though I didn't go to that school. Um, but, yeah, Brendan was with me in Iraq for a little while as a, as a brand new guy. He showed up and very, very impressive young man, um, high character, high integrity, high performance, and, and well thought of by the boys, which is the real measure of, uh, of what we look for in officers. And he was one of those. And, and so, yeah, it does. It, it laces a lot more intensity and a lot more, uh, I guess, humility into the game when those stories come up. All right, Rourke, uh, let's wrap up on, on a thought on this. Uh, you were a letter of distinction at the university a couple of years ago, honored, and that's uh, as prestigious as it can get as a alum from the, the athletic program. Uh, what was that like for you, for one? And what's it like for you now as an alum, sort of look, looking back across the, the country at university and all, all the goings on? Yeah, I just feel be you know super lucky to be part of that program, that tradition, um, and that school. I, I I don't know if you know this, but my grandfather went to Syracuse. My dad and mom went to Syracuse. She grew up there, right there at Nottingham um, High, and and you know my dad grew up down in Brooklyn, but then went to Syracuse. That's where they met. So it was this unbelievable circle that I kind of closed. And I guess you know I've got kiddos. My brother's got kiddos. Somebody else could keep it going, but. Uh, no, it, I felt very lucky to be part of it. I felt a tremendous family tradition connected to it. Playing um, for that Syracuse um, program is just one of those that you kind of you get a chance to stamp stamp your name and etch it into history when you when you play for that program. Uh, and then you know being a letter winner and connected to you know all the great people. I mean it, that, that's what's fun about being there as well. Is it's it's just such a, a powerhouse. Um, athletic tradition and program that you start seeing the names that you get to call peers and, and friends and, and legacy teammates. And it, it's special, very, very special to be a part of it. So um, I feel lucky. And uh, when I can support the, the school and the program, I do. And, and uh, I'll bleed orange forever. All right, Rourke, no better person to join our Q's Connection series on this Memorial Day weekend uh, than you. Uh, enjoy it. And uh, we'll be thinking of you. And uh, thanks so much here for a few minutes. No, I appreciate it. Take care, brother.